being with us. Dr. Well, Morth. Thank you so much, Chairman Sanders, and thank you so much, Ranking Member Cassidy, for your leadership as well on issues related to mental health. To all the members of the committee who are here today, I'm Dr. Vivek Murthy. I have the privilege of serving as Surgeon General and as Vice Admiral of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, uh, but I'm most importantly here as a father of two young children who is concerned about their future and the future of kids across America. And I'm here to speak about what I believe is the defining public health issue of our time, and that is a youth mental health crisis. It now threatens the foundation for health and well-being for millions of our children. In 2021, more than two in five high school students, including almost 60% of girls and 70% of LGBTQ youth, uh, reported feeling persistently sad or hopeless. Nearly one in five high school students reported making a suicide plan, and this followed a 57% increase in the suicide rate among young people in the decade prior to the pandemic. In response to this crisis in December 2021, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory on protecting youth mental health. And I did this to call our nation's attention to this urgent issue and to the need to act. Over the last two years, I am grateful uh, that Congress on a bipartisan basis and the Biden administration have made unprecedented investments to strengthen the mental health care system and to connect more youth to care. And these investments have already started to help children and families. But as all of you know, we have much more to do. Last month, my office released two new Surgeon General's advisories, one on our epidemic of loneliness and isolation, and the other on social media and youth mental health. Together, they explore two important drivers of the youth mental health crisis. Regarding loneliness and isolation, we now understand that social disconnection is both exceedingly common and profoundly consequential. About one in two adults are reporting measurable levels of loneliness, and social disconnection is associated with an increased risk of not only de depression, anxiety, and suicide, but also heart disease, dementia, stroke, and premature death. The loneliness epidemic has hit young people particularly hard, and they have the highest rates of loneliness across age groups. Uh, the time young people ages 15 through 24 spend in person with friends declined by more than 50% from 2003 to 2019. Furthermore, there's been a decline in participation over the last half century in community organizations that have traditionally brought us together, including faith organizations and recreational leagues. Second, though, I'm increasingly concerned about the harmful impact that social media is having on youth mental health. Despite near universal use, there's inadequate evidence to conclude that social media is sufficiently safe for our kids. And while social media may provide some benefits for some children, there's a growing body of research associating social media use with potential harms. Uh, this is especially concerning during adolescence, which is a highly sensitive period of brain development for kids when they're particularly susceptible to peer comparison. Now, the data show that youth who spend more than three hours a day on social media face double the risk of experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety. This is deeply worrisome because on average, teenagers are spending three and a half hours a day on social media. And excessive social media use can also disrupt activities that are essential for healthy development, like physical activity, sleep, and in-person interactions. For example, a third of adolescents are telling us that they stay up until midnight or later on weeknights in front of their screens, and much of that is, in fact, social media use. Uh, in addition, too often kids on social media are exposed to extreme, inappropriate, and harmful content. Uh, indeed, nearly half of adolescents are saying that social media now makes them feel worse about their bodies. Now, two other drivers of youth mental health crisis that I just want to note briefly. One is trauma, which has become all too common in young people's lives, particularly from violence and abuse and the loss of loved ones to incarceration, addiction, and death. When young people go through such adverse childhood experiences, we know it has a negative impact on their mental and physical health. Additionally, for many young people, their confidence in the future has been undermined by the serious challenges they are set to inherit from economic inequality and climate change to racism and gun violence. This is what they say to me time and time again when I meet with young people around the country. The bottom line is our kids can't afford to wait longer for us to address the youth mental health crisis. We have to expand our efforts to ensure every child has access to high quality, affordable, culturally competent mental health care. But we also must tackle the root causes by addressing the potential harms of social media through age appropriate health and safety standards and data transparency requirements, by investing in school-based programs that equip children with the tools 
to manage their emotions, adversity, and their mental health by addressing trauma, particularly violence, and by embarking on a generational effort to rebuild social connection and community in America. Finally, we can all play a role in addressing the ongoing shame and stigma that still surround mental health and prevent young people from asking for help. Now, our obligation finally to act is not just medical, it is moral. Uh, it's about fulfilling our most sacred responsibility to care for our children and to secure a better future for them. I thank you for giving this critical issue the attention and the action it deserves, and I'll look forward to your questions. Um, let me turn to Senator Cassidy, who will introduce our next witness. It's an honor to, it is an honor to introduce Mrs. Catherine Neese, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services at the